Tonight, the special counsel in the hot seat. I can tell you that partisan politics had no place whatsoever in my work. Robert Hurd took on scrutiny from both sides over his Biden documents inquiry as the president's memory became a central focus and the lack of evidence to charge Biden over his handling of classified docs just as voters head to the polls to vote in their presidential primaries. Plus, the failing grade for Boeing by the FAA after multiple scares aboard the airline that's causing concern among flyers, how the company is responding. And... Haiti's prime minister announced he'd step aside following weeks of violence aimed at forcing his resignation. In tonight's Prime Focus, we look at what happens next as gangs overrun the country's capital. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight in the nation's capital with the fireworks in Congress as Biden special counsel Robert Hur vigorously defended his investigation into Biden retaining sensitive material from his vice presidency. Hur frequently sparred with both Democrats and Republicans as lawmakers on both sides tried to use his testimony for partisan means. Democrats accused him of gratuitous language about Biden's mental acuity and invoked the fact that he's a registered Republican. Republicans slammed his decision not to bring criminal charges. Her made a point of depriving both parties' chances to score political points. At one point, he took issue with Democrats saying his report cleared Biden of criminal wrongdoing, testifying it did not exonerate him. We're standing by to get legal analysis of what this will mean going forward. But first, we begin with our chief White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. Mr. Hur, do you believe Joe Biden's mentally competent? Tonight on Capitol Hill, former special counsel Robert Hur facing hostile questions from both Republicans and Democrats as he defended his conclusion that President Biden had mishandled classified documents but should not be prosecuted. We identified evidence that the president willfully retained classified materials after the end of his vice presidency when he was a private citizen. We did not, however, identify evidence that rose to the level of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Her has come under attack from Democrats for saying one of the reasons Biden should not be prosecuted is because he would likely present himself to a jury, as he did during our interview of him, as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. My assessment in the report about the relevance of the president's memory was necessary and accurate and fair. I did not sanitize my explanation, nor did I disparage the president unfairly. Today, Democrats unloading. You understood when you made that decision, didn't you, Mr. Hur, that you would ignite a political firestorm with that language, didn't you? Congressman, politics played no part whatsoever in my investigative steps. But today, Republicans furious, too, asking, should Biden not be prosecuted just because he's sympathetic? One of the points you make is that President Biden is likely to be an elderly, sympathetic uh, a figure with a poor memory. But how does that bear on any individual's guilt or innocence? Isn't that, again, a question for a judge or jury to decide? Democrats emphasizing Hur's note that Biden fully cooperated with the investigation, unlike Donald Trump. Did you find that President Biden engage in a conspiracy to obstruct justice? No. Did you find that President Biden engage in a scheme to conceal? No. But Hur forcefully pushing back when Democrats declared his report exonerated the president. So this lengthy, expensive, and independent investigation resulted in a complete exoneration of President Joe Biden. I need to um, go back and, and make sure that I take take note of the word that you used, uh, exoneration. That Mr. is not a word Herr, that I'm going to continue with my questions. I'm going to continue with my questions. I know that, that I the term that I ultimately reached I know that whether the term sufficient evidence existed such that the likely you outcome you, you exonerated would be a conviction. Him. I know that I the term willful that retention the has a Mr. Hurd, it's my time. Some contentious moments there. Mary Bruce joins us now from the White House. Mary, I know that the White House released the transcript of President Biden's interview with the special counsel. You've had a chance to read through it. What stood out to you in particular about those memory lapses the special counsel flagged in the report? Well, Lindsay, the full transcript of the president's five-hour interview with the special counsel really does paint a nuanced picture where there are there are points where the president's memory does lapse, including, for instance, when he's discussing his son, Beau. The president recalls the day of his death, but struggles to remember the year and has to be prompted repeatedly by his staff. But at other points, the president offers detailed descriptions of years-old events. He's very conversational, even jokes around with members of the special counsel's team and the interviewers. And yes, he does 
does go off on several tangents and rambles a bit, but that's certainly not unusual for this president, Lindsay. All right, Mary Bruce Forrest from the White House. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you. And for more context on today's hearing, we're joined now by ABC News legal contributor Kim Whaley. Uh, Kim, how rare is it or isn't it for a prosecutor, let alone a federal prosecutor? I explain why they chose not to pursue charges. Well, this is really rare to find out in this kind of detail why they decided not to to bring charges. Normally that's completely confidential because unless there's an actual indictment, the idea is it's completely innocent, not even innocent until proven guilty. The issue here is the question of willfulness. That's one of the criteria in the in the legal standard. And there, I think the conclusion was this was inadvertent. There just wasn't enough evidence that he willfully withheld this. He could have mistakenly withheld this information, but a mistake does not give rise to a criminal charge. And when the report came out, there was also a focus on whether or not President Biden remembered, which the president very emotionally denied the death of his son, Bo. Did any more insight come of this comment during today's hearing? Yeah, honestly, I think this is a place where uh, special counsel Her made of maybe made of made a misstep because he said in the report that he couldn't remember his son's uh, uh, death as if that was so obvious, um, something a, a man would would know. And if you read the report and it came out today, the actual transcript, it sounds like he was trying to remember something else and said it was May 30th to himself, and then had to be reminded of, of the actual year, but it wasn't in the context of being asked about his death. So I think that that's a fair critique that maybe her went a little too far in drawing some conclusions around what was just an, an understandable normal moment where he was just thinking of multiple things at once. And how does Biden's investigation into his handling of classified documents compare to Trump's case? Well, I don't think we'd even have seen this if it weren't for Trump's case, because, you know, presidents take stuff home um, and there's probably all kinds of things mixed in with with this uh, in former president's uh, situations. But here, of course, Donald Trump moved the information around Mar-a-Lago. He didn't produce responses to the FBI, to the National Archives. Um, there's evidence that he might have directed uh, staff to dis to destroy videotapes. It's the obstruction. It's the cover up. It's the refusal to cooperate. And of course, you're talking as we're seeing in the in the, the clips right now, boxes and boxes in bathrooms and in, in, in really obvious places where other people could have had access. So it's really apples and oranges. It's not even close in terms of the damage potentially to national security. And we've heard from the White House now saying case closed. You saw the Democrats there saying uh, that he's been exonerated. Uh, her really pushed back on that aggressively, saying he has not been exonerated. Well, he didn't use that language, but ultimately is the same outcome. Well, exonerated is not a legal term. And so I agree with him there. The technical lawyerly response is there just wasn't evidence to prove to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt that a crime was occurred. In regular parlance, maybe that means exonerated. It certainly means he can't prove that Joe Biden committed any crime. And I think we all understand what that is. I, the State of the Union, how agile the president was, how sharp he was at the State of the Union, that coupled with this, I think probably puts it to rest. But absent that performance, this today could have been a real problem for, for Joe Biden, but we might actually even see this age thing start to fade, which is good politically for the president. So perhaps we have turned a page there, but we shall see. ABC News legal contributor Kimberly Whaley, thank you so much as always. Thank you. New troubles for Boeing amid growing concerns about quality control. A longtime worker turned whistleblower found dead from an apparent suicide. ABC's Trevor Alt has those details. Tonight, a Boeing whistleblower now dead from an apparent suicide only days after his lawyer says he'd been deposed. John Barnett worked for Boeing for 32 years and was involved in a lawsuit alleging serious safety concerns with the 787 Dreamliner and retaliation from the company. His lawyers say Barnett was in very good spirits and we didn't see any indication he would take his own life. But police in South Carolina say he died Saturday from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. His body found inside a car in a hotel parking lot. In January, just weeks after a door plug flew off an Alaska Airlines Boeing 737 MAX 9, Barnett spoke with TMZ Live. What we're seeing with the door plug blowout is what I've seen with the rest of the airplane as far as jobs not being completed properly, inspection steps being removed, um, 
issues being ignored. Since that incident, a six-week FAA review of the Boeing production line has raised new concerns. The New York Times reporting Boeing failed 33 of 89 audits, and Boeing supplier Spirit Aerosystems, which builds the 737 MAX fuselage, failed more than half of its 13 audits. As difficult and as painful these inspections are for Boeing, they will help them get back to basics to be able to begin to earn the trust of the FAA and the flying public. Regaining that trust, so critical. Trevor All joins us now. Trevor, has Boeing said anything about the death of John Burnett? So they did release a brief statement, Lindsay. They said they're saddened by Mr. Barnett's passing and that their thoughts are with his friends and family. His attorney, however, put out a pretty lengthy statement. They say they are shocked at his passing. They're calling for a full investigation from police, and they want police to tell the public what they find out. Lindsay? All right, Trevor Alt, looking for transparency there. Our thanks to you. Overseas in the Middle East, the body of a dual U.S. citizen is being held hostage by Hamas as a ceasefire deal has failed. This is efforts to get desperately needed aid into Gaza are ramping up. ABC's Matt Gutman is in Israel for us tonight. Tonight, the IDF announcing dual citizen Itai Khen, one of several American hostages believed alive in Gaza, was actually killed in fighting during Hamas's October 7th rampage. Hamas then taking the 19-year-old soldier's body into Gaza. In the weeks after the attack, we spoke to his father. Ruby, are you hopeful that you will ever see your son again? Oh, that's no, no option to think otherwise. I am positive that I will see him back again. With the hostage release and ceasefire deal stalling last week, tonight Israel's prime minister again insisting that Israel will invade the southern Gazan city of Rafah, where 1.5 million people are seeking shelter and hunger is epidemic. That is aid to Gaza now arriving from land, air, and sea. For the first time, a ship is en route to deliver aid directly to Gaza. Working in coordination with the Israeli military, the NGO World Central Kitchen is sending 200 tons of rice, beans, flour, and proteins set to arrive as early as tomorrow. Our team in Gaza filming trucks carrying landfill to northern Gaza to build this makeshift anchorage. Once this gets there, it'll be offloaded by a crane. It'll be put on trucks, and we'll be taking that into northern Gaza. And the U.S. set to build another temporary pier off the coast of Gaza. Hours ago, 500 U.S. troops deploying from Virginia. Matt Gutman joins us now. It, Matt, we're told that larger U.S. pier could take weeks to set up. What happens in the interim? This is where that World Central Kitchen um, makeshift anchorage, they're calling it, becomes so important, Lindsay. Uh, the Israelis, the UAE, which are behind it, the Cypriots, uh, this is a, a whole group of nations and organizations that are behind this. Hope to start a maritime convoy of aid heading from Cyprus to that port or anchorage that the World Central Kitchen is building and make that a, a regular conduit of aid directly to northern Gaza. That's where the hunger is most severe. Lindsay. Matt Cutman, our thanks to you reporting in from Jerusalem. Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henry has agreed to resign, ceding power to a presidential council following weeks of soaring anti-government violence led by an alliance of gangs. In a video, the prime minister said, quote, the government that I am leading cannot remain indifferent to this situation. Gangs launched an armed rebellion in Port-au-Prince this month, calling for Henri to resign and attacking a series of government targets. The Biden administration says the U.S. welcomes a transitional presidential council for Haiti and commended Henri for, quote, putting his country and Haitians first. With aid to Ukraine stalled in Congress, the White House today announced a stopgap plan, delivering $300 million in military aid. It comes as a wave of Ukrainian drones and pro-Ukrainian militia attacked deep inside Russia just days before their presidential election. James Longman reports. Tonight, two simultaneous attacks inside Russia. Pro-Ukrainian militia launching a major incursion as the Ukrainian military fired a wave of drones, two of the biggest strikes yet inside Russia. Body camera video shows those pro-Ukrainian fighters storming across the border. Russia claims it repelled the attack, killing more than 200 fighters, though it's still not clear if the situation is under control. As that barrage of Ukrainian drones hit multiple locations, setting this oil refinery ablaze. It's the biggest challenge to Vladimir Putin on Russian soil since last year's failed Wagner coup and comes just days before Russia's presidential election. The Kremlin responding in kind, a Russian missile slamming into a residential building south of Kyiv, killing at least three people and injuring dozens more. 
And tonight, with Republicans in Congress blocking more aid to Ukraine, the White House announcing a new $300 million security package. Putin will keep going. President Biden today saying those supplies will only last a couple of weeks, urging Congress to send Ukraine the help it needs. We must act before it literally is too late. And Lindsay, tonight the White House says that extra Ukraine money comes from Pentagon savings. Of course, Ukraine is still waiting for that larger military aid package worth $60 billion that Congress has yet to pass. Lindsay? James, thank you. U.S. lawmakers are threatening to ban TikTok, but giving its Chinese parent company a chance to keep it running. According to the bipartisan bill, TikTok users in the U.S. could keep scrolling on the app as long as Beijing-based company ByteDance sells the video sharing platform to a non-Chinese company in the next six months. A House committee unanimously voted in favor of the bill, saying it would protect the country from the, quote, threat posed by foreign adversary controlled applications. The House of Representatives is expected to vote on the bill this week. Scott Peterson faced a California judge today as he fights for a new trial in the murder of his pregnant wife, Lacey, and their unborn son. Peterson was sentenced 20 years ago, but the Innocence Project has taken up his case and is asking for investigators to look at what they say is new evidence. Arcana Whitworth was in the courtroom. 20 years after he was convicted of murdering his pregnant wife and unborn child, Scott Peterson today appeared before a judge by Zoom to fight for a new trial. Good morning, Mr. Peterson. Can you both see and hear the proceedings, sir? Yes, sir, I can. Thank you. Peterson is serving life in prison, but the LA Innocence Project is now leading his defense, arguing new and overlooked evidence could exonerate him. Mr. Peterson has been waiting 20 years to find some of these police reports and audio recordings and video recordings that should have been provided. The defense wants new DNA testing on blood found in this burned out van discovered near the family home the day after Lacey disappeared. The original fire investigator believes the evidence should be reassessed. This has always been one of those things that kind of sits in the back of your head and kind of bugs you a little bit. Peterson has always maintained his innocence, sitting down with our Diane Sawyer. Everybody sitting at home wants the answer to the same question. Did you murder your wife? No, no, uh, I just thought. A few months later, the bodies washing up on shore, not far from where Peterson claimed to have gone fishing the day Lacey disappeared. The former detective on the case says he welcomes new DNA testing. The big thing is test that blood. If we had the wrong guy, I want the truth to come out. I just don't have any doubts. And Lindsay, the Innocence Project thinks that a robbery across the street from the Peterson home could be connected to Lacey's disappearance. They also want the witnesses that said they saw Lacey around that time to be re-interviewed. And they could learn if that DNA could be retested at a hearing in May. But prior to that, the next time we see Scott Peterson in court will be on April 16th. Lindsay. All right, Kena, you know, we know that you'll keep coverage for that on us, for us. Our thanks to you. And we do have some breaking news to pass along. ABC News can project President Biden has won the state of Georgia, and that means we can also project Joe Biden has surpassed the delegate threshold to become the presumptive Democratic nominee for President of the United States. And taking a look right now, the Republican side of the primary in Georgia, we can also project Donald Trump will win that primary. All of this sets up a likely November face-off between the two. Let's go to ABC political director Rick Klein for more. Yeah, Lindsay, Joe Biden making it official. Democratic voters really didn't have much, many options in this, in this primary process, but he ended up clinching about as quickly as he, as he could have. This whole process all started back in New Hampshire where he made a strategic decision not to even appear on the ballot. It looked like that could backfire, but he mounted a write-in campaign and at the time held down his opponents to relatively sm a small uh, uh, share of the vote. That ended up being a fateful decision and kind of kind of stopped the, the, the momentum for any potential challenger. We saw something interesting started to develop when Michigan voted. We saw a big push among people, including some people that were angry over his handling of the Israel-Hamas war, uh, pushed to get an uncommitted delegates to the convention. And more than 100,000 votes in Michigan supported uh, uncommitted. We saw even a higher number, a higher share in, in Minnesota a week later. Again, a little, bit of a, a little bit of a worrying sign for the president. We saw something similar in Colorado where uncommitted got, you know, about 9% of the vote. We 
saw it happen in North Carolina, where more than 12 percent got went for no preference in Virginia. Some of his opponents also did relatively well. But this was a clean sweep for all intents and purposes. Joe Biden never really had a scare in this process. And now he's able to focus on the general election out of the State of the Union address last week. And, and as you can see, the polling in the battleground states have it incredibly, incredibly close. And our 538 polling average, uh, you see all these recent polls at 538, they have Trump right now with a very narrow edge. So it is going to be a tough road from here. And a lot of it from here, Lindsay, is going to be about Joe Biden bringing his base fully back on board. So we now know what many have expected for a while, Rick. Thank you. We will expect a, a Trump-Biden rematch come November. So much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Airbnb announces new rules. We tell you what to expect next time you rent. But next, we take you to Haiti, the Caribbean nation overrun by political instability and violence, with some people stranded in a hospital with nowhere to go. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not a pair, in it? How important it made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my own. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Everything I've experienced, it made me realize what I want and what I don't want. Tom Brady and Giselle Bundchen announcing their divorce. You didn't think that the marriage would end. You said it was the death of a dream. Yeah. How are you? Well, when you say... Sorry, guys. I didn't know... Can I have a little moment? Giselle Bundchen climbing the mountain. I'm leaving my truth and I'm not apologizing for it. Now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Welcome back. As we mentioned a few minutes ago, Haiti is on a brink of becoming a failed state. A gangland rebellion is ripping through the republic. The prime minister has announced he will step down once a transitional presidential council is in place. But will the gang leaders at the heart of the fighting reject that plan, continuing to put Haitians at the center of the crisis? The human toll, hunger, violence and unrest has been unthinkable. Our Matt Rivers, who's been reporting on conditions there now for years, takes us back to Haiti to see that toll firsthand. <laughs> Haiti is collapsing. The country has been ravaged by two weeks of chaos, <laughs> of bloodshed, <laughs> of intense fighting and horrific human suffering with no obvious way out. Port-au-Prince is no stranger to gang violence, but an unholy alliance has emerged between the most powerful armed groups. 
now unified behind this man, Jimmy Chercier, a.k.a. Barbecue. The first step in the battle is to retire Ariel Henry under power. Then, to declare the real battle against power, and to declare the battle real against the system, the system of the gap, the politics traditional. And that first step, now done. The unelected prime minister, Ariel Henry, resigned on Monday after agreeing to a transitional government. Henri now out after weeks of horrific violence led by Barbecue, Haiti's most notorious gang leader. He and his soldiers have launched massive coordinated assaults around Port-au-Prince for nearly two weeks. Dozens of police stations, many destroyed. Gang members even showing off stolen body armor. Constant assaults at the airport forced it to shut down too. But the people he says he's trying to free, ordinary Haitians, are being decimated by the fighting. The violence has paralyzed Port-au-Prince, a hellscape now cut off from the outside world. Hospitals around the city show the human toll. In this major hospital, no doctors or nurses can even make it to work to help the patients. Gangs have barricaded off entire sections of the city to slow down police, attacking those who dare cross. Haiti was struggling before this crisis broke out, among the worst hunger crises in the world. This crisis existed before. There were 1.6 million people in Port-au-Prince who didn't have enough to eat. Before this crisis, this is making things worse. Things are so bad in Port-au-Prince, even the director of the World Food Program for Haiti can't get in. He spoke to us from Cap Haitien, a city in the north. This warehouse full of food that people in Port-au-Prince could certainly use but even if WFP wanted to send it, they can't. The capital city is blocked. There's no way in and out that's safe. With the port now being closed, uh, the, the, the real risk is that the 1.6 million people in Port-au-Prince were acutely food insecure could tip into famine. This is one of the most extreme situations I've ever seen as an aid worker. Dozens of gang members and nearly a half dozen police have been killed in the fighting while thousands of citizens have been forced to flee from their homes. Over the weekend, the U.S. evacuated non-essential embassy personnel in the night, choppering in Marines to reinforce the embassy. The State Department urging Americans to leave. Haitians, though, have nowhere else to go. It all led to this week, a series of emergency meetings in Jamaica with Haitian stakeholders, regional leaders, and even the U.S. Secretary of State. Henri resigns, and now in his place, a soon-to-be-set-up council of seven people who collectively will act as Haiti's president. The question, is that enough to stop the violence? Haiti has long been in decline. Bonjour. Bonjour. I've been there many times in the last few years, including last year, as farmers struggled to sell their produce amongst gang rule. Countless others went hungry, forced to eat mud pies, a mixture of mud, salt, and butter. No one wants to eat this. Yeah, but if you're starving, you'll, you'll get to. So what now? How does the violence end? In the short term, Barbecue says it's simple. Take that with a grain of salt. Barbecue is also a disgraced former policeman, accused of planning a 2018 massacre that killed dozens, sanctioned by the U.S. and the U.N. His gangs have terrorized this country for years with murders, kidnappings, and extortion, taking advantage of a political vacuum. 
but a ceasefire in any form would be welcome relief. That's what Caribbean leaders joined by Secretary of State Antony Blinken have been aiming toward this week, with a series of meetings designed to somehow ease Henri out of power. The joint proposal that was developed by CARICOM and all of the Haitian stakeholders to expedite a political transition. That political transition is taking place this week. But who exactly takes over and when new elections will take place, still unclear. And with that, fears that the fighting could go on. Change does seem necessary. Our thanks to Matt for that. Still much more to get to coming up. We tell you how you can potentially cash in on Reddit. But next, we break down the congressional committee hearing on President Biden's classified docs by the numbers. Everything I've experienced, it made me realize what I want and what I don't want. Tom Brady and Giselle Bundchen announcing their divorce. You didn't think that the marriage would end. You said it was the death of a dream. Yeah. How are you? Well, when you say... Sorry, guys. I didn't know... Can I have a little moment? Giselle Bundchen climbing the mountain. I'm leaving my truth and I'm not apologizing for it. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. You're along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You should see me. Strongest females fight for the survival of their families. Oh, hey, the queens. You should see me in a crowd. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills star Erica Jane. Celebrity attorney Tom Girardi. This story was a nuclear explosion. Today, several victims will get a chance to finally meet Erica Girardi. I'm at sort of a loss for what to say. Did you see the documentary? Yeah. The Housewife and the Hustler? I did. I wanted Erica to say, I'm sorry, face to face. Erica, why did it take you so long? The Housewife and the Hustler 2. Only on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Welcome back, everyone. Former special counsel Robert Hur was on the hot seat today answering questions from the House Judiciary Committee. The report on President Biden's handling of classified documents and the man behind it is tonight's By the Numbers. For a little over four hours, both Republicans and Democrats grilled her about his 381-page report, which found no criminal charges were warranted against Biden for classified documents found in his Delaware home and at a former office. President Biden himself noted the scope of the investigation. This was an exhaustive investigation going back literally more than 40 years, 40 years when I became a United States senator. 
In total, investigators took approximately 80 documents from Biden containing classification markings, several hundred pages overall. Seven million documents were collected, including emails, text, photos, all the way down to toll records. Her and his team interviewed 147 witnesses, including a five-hour interview with the president himself. And her is no stranger to politically charged investigations. While in the Justice Department in 2017, he helped monitor the Mueller probe into alleged Russian interference in the previous year's presidential election. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight, from working behind the scenes with Harry Styles to picking up the mic himself. Mitch Rowland joins us to discuss his debut album. Actor Jennifer Lewis opens up exclusively to our Robin Roberts about what she describes as the hardest year of her life due to a 10-foot fall. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives and the magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not a pair, in it? How important it made the U.S. Day. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's David. David. I'm David Muir. I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. The Tate brothers arrested again, Airbnb bans indoor cameras, and Reddit prepares to go public. These stories and more in tonight's Rundown.
An urgent search in Nashville for 22-year-old Riley Strain. Nashville police say the University of Missouri student was last seen on Friday night at this bar owned by country music star Luke Bryan. Riley parted way with his friends around 10 p.m. and hasn't been seen or heard from since. The senior's family traveling to Nashville to join the search, desperate for answers. He doesn't go without talking to family. I mean, there's not a day go by that he doesn't, you know, whether it's text, phone call. According to his family, Riley's cell phone was last tracked just a mile from the bar, but in the opposite direction of the hotel. And authorities say they've been unable to successfully ping his cell phone since. A spokeswoman for Andrew Tate says he and his brother were held Monday evening on allegations of sexual aggression in a UK case dating back around a decade ago. The Bucharest Court of Appeal is set to consider soon on whether to execute the warrants. We are innocent men. No, we're very innocent men, and in time, everybody's going to see that, and we're very excited to finish this judicial process and clear our names. Four women initially had reported the two to UK authorities, but the Crown Prosecution Service here decided not to proceed. The alleged victims then turned to crowdfunding in pursuit of a civil case. The Consumer Price Index, a measure of inflation in the U.S., shows prices were 3.2% higher in February compared to a year ago. That number beating analysts' expectations of a 3.1% increase. But compared to January, prices went up 0.4%, which is in line with expectations. The cost of rent, airfares, insurance, clothing, recreation, gas, and electricity all went up in February. But grocery store prices were unchanged, while the cost of dining out went up a modest 0.1%. Where were the savings, personal care, and household furnishings? Cameras aren't allowed in Airbnb bathrooms and bedrooms, but they have been allowed in common spaces like hallways and kitchens, so long as the renter was told they were there. After next month, though, those will also be banned. The only exception will be video doorbells and devices to monitor noise levels, again, so long as the renter is made aware. Airbnb says most cameras have already been removed from properties and that this rule will affect very few homeowners. 199 days after they lifted off, four crew members, one each from Japan, Denmark, Russia, and the United States, have dropped gently into the Gulf of Mexico to await the recovery boats. Dragon, splash down. During 3,184 orbits and 84 million miles, the team, led by Marine Combat Helicopter Pilot Jasmine Mogbelli, completed a long slate of experiments aboard the International Space Station. Reddit, that vast repository of internet discussion, projected a price for its initial public offering stock that values the social media platform at up to $6.4 billion. The offering also makes Reddit one of the first online companies to offer shares to its contributors, the people who comment on its boards and the moderators who manage them. Reddit plans to list 22 million shares at a price between $31 and $34, according to documents filed with the SEC. Have you ever wondered if your car is spying on you? New driving data might give you some new insight. ABC's Morgan Norwood has more. Driver beware. Your car could be recording how you drive, your speed, or any hard braking, and then transmitting that data to an information clearinghouse. The New York Times reports that data clearinghouse, LexisNexis, is working with insurance companies and their collaboration could drive your insurance rates higher. In that broad sense, we're all connected and devices are connected. It would not be surprising to see that others also might be having some, some plans. The data collection was uncovered by drivers using General Motors OnStar service, which is traditionally used to make an emergency call. The owner of a Chevy Bolt told the Times he uncovered a 258-page report on his personal driving habits after he asked about a more than 20% increase in his insurance rate. His insurance company told him to check his LexisNexis file, and turns out GM's OnStar service has a smart driver feature, which tracks driver habits as a way to improve safety. GM confirmed to the Times that it shares select insights with LexisNexis and another data broker, but says the program is optional to customers and that drivers can unenroll at any time. This is the beginning of, a, of an era where we will continue to be connected in every possible way. Cars might seem like the last bastion of this you know, cocoon-like environment, but it's one more thing that's getting connected. 
Nationwide, auto insurance rates are up 26% this year, rising six times faster than overall inflation. The increase is blamed on several factors, including the rising cost of car repairs. But now you can add another factor, the possibility of your insurance companies tracking how you drive. Another instance of Big Brother is watching. Our thanks to Morgan for that. The front man for the Raspberries, Eric Carmen, has passed away, and we are remembering his life and legacy. He leaves us with hits like Hungry Eyes and All By Myself. ABC's Lara Spencer has the story. Eric Carmen's Hungry Eyes became one of the biggest hits from one of the biggest movies in the 1980s. Smash from the Dirty Dancing soundtrack reaching number four on the charts in 1988. But long before that, Carmen was known as a prolific singer-songwriter, heading the hit Go All The Way for his band The Raspberries in 1972. Then as a solo artist, he wrote and sang all by myself in 1975. The same song Celine Dion would later turn into a worldwide smash two decades later. Carmen would also compose Almost Paradise from Footloose. I face the nights alone. Oh, how could I have known that all my life I only needed you? Oh, almost paradise. In a statement, his wife Amy writing, it brought him great joy to know that for decades his music touched so many and will be his lasting legacy. Eric Carmen was 74. Those songs will no doubt live on. Our thanks to Laura for that. Blackish star Jennifer Lewis is revealing a near-death accident she experienced during a trip to Africa that left her unable to walk. She opened up to Good Morning America anchor Robin Roberts. The warmest and most expected welcome from Ms. Jennifer Lewis, the lady known to make you laugh. Hey, when was your birthday? January 25th, month after Jesus. So anyway, <laughs> don't you know that? Preparing how she knows best to share a serious personal revelation for the first time. In one word, finish this sentence. This past year has been... the hardest. The last year challenging for Jennifer, who in 2022 says she was sitting on top of the world, celebrating the finale of the long running hit comedy show, Blackish. I am gonna miss you, Rainbow. Blackish has just wrapped up. You didn't know what you were going to do, and you thought, oh, maybe this is time for me yeah. to ride off into the sunset. I was gonna retire and moved back home. I conquered a dream. I had traveled around the world, and life was wonderful. Jennifer, reveling in her notable career as an entertainer on the big stage. Good old Aunt Mama. Now, that's a strong woman. I never saw her with a man. <laughs> and in 90s cult classics like Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Boom! That, that, boom! Her famed high kicks, making the rounds, including on GMA. The multi-talented Jennifer Lewis. Yeah! To celebrate her new book release. <laughs> Little did anyone know, two months later, while on a trip of a lifetime, her life flashing before her eyes. Let's go to November 2022. 
you are the queen of adventure. <laughs> no, you, lo you love an adventure. Yeah. And you are going to Africa. You go from Cape Town. To Rwanda. To Rwanda. I went up in the mountains with the gorillas. <laughs> that was real scary. Mm. But it does give you a, a sense of fearlessness and courage. We're having a good time, you know? We're, we're feeling a lot. We're going where the real people are. And now you're heading to the Serengeti. Yes. What were you most looking forward to? Oh, the, the safari. I mean, when you're looking at these animals, when you see four lioness coming with those big claws and the paws and their beauty, you're looking at the face of God. Well, this is the migration. We're so lucky. Yeah, the migration. They're gone across the road, the wildebeest, they're moving on. You're there at the Serengeti, at the hotel. Mm. Your friend Lori has gone to her room. It's the end of the first day there. Yes. What happened next at the hotel? Well, the sun set. And when the sun sets in the Serengeti, there are no street lights. It is pitch black. I was escorted to the lodge, my room, but I wasn't given a tour. I should have been given a tour. I laid out my safari clothes, and I saw the infinity pool out on my deck. So I went out. I was just taking in the fact that I was back in the Serengeti once again, and I'm walking, and all of a sudden, boom, I had fallen 10 feet mm, into a dry, ravine full of boulders and stones and sharp rocks, Robin. I fell. Off the balcony into that ravine. Yes. There was a space that was not sectioned off, and there was no sign that said caution. Ten feet drop. What kind of pain were you experiencing? Well, of course, I was in shock. My right hip took the impact. My shoulder went up against a stone. A lightning bolt went through my mind's eye right here. In pitch black, I didn't know I was falling. Nothing would move. So I laid there. I said, move your body, baby. Come on, Jenny, move your body. And then I called for my friend Lori. It was hard to even take a big breath to scream. And you're in the middle of the Serengeti. There are animals. There are wild animals. Because when Lori shined her flashlight down there, she didn't know there was a Cape Buffalo 10 feet away. And when Lori ran to get help, I heard a lion roar. My last thought, because I am Jennifer Lewis, was what a headline. <laughs> the king ain't the queen. Oh. Pieces of Jennifer Lewis's body is being flown back to the States. Just a riveting conversation. You can watch the full conversation tonight in our special report. After the fall, a conversation with Robin Roberts and Jennifer Lewis airing at 8.30 p.m. right here on ABC News Live and streaming starting tomorrow on Hulu. For our next guest, one fateful day back in 2016 changed everything. As he was working as a dishwasher at L.A. Pizza Restaurant, Mitch Rowland received a call from his then roommate. They were in a recording session with Harry Styles and asked if he could replace a guitarist who hadn't showed up. Eight years, a Grammy, and a world tour later, Roland isn't slowing down, and he's now ready to share his story and sound with his debut album, Come June, featuring singles like Here Comes the Comeback. Let's take a listen.
and Mitch Rowland, kind enough to join us now in studio. Mitch, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. So it's been quite a wild ride the last few years. Talk about getting that call back in 2016. Uh, I, th I think the call came and I said, I can be there. And then I, th I, th I don't think anything happened the first day that I was meant to go in. And then I actually went in the next day and things clicked into place. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm still kind of at a loss for words talking about it because it just doesn't uh, th those kinds of things don't happen I, you know being next to Harry on stage for the last however many years you know he'll say to the crowd uh, this doesn't happen to people like me and it also doesn't happen to people like myself so um, yeah lucky to be here every day you didn't realize in that moment that was gonna be life-changing not really <laughs> You've described Come June as folksy with a delicate minimalism. What does that mean? Um, I needed to get back to, I think, coming off of all that over the last, you know, playing massive shows and uh, everything that goes with that. I kind of had to simplify things as much as possible. Um, go back to just playing on the edge of the bed. Mm. Um, the way, kind of, the way things used to be. Um, and a lot of, like, British folk was a huge inspiration. Uh, just a guy and a guitar was um, what I wanted to try and work towards myself. And I kind of had to, I had to dream up these little songs on the, the smallest level to kind of start over and do something mm. new. After writing for others for so many years, how did you find your own voice? Um, I think making this record made me realize I've, my voice has always been there. What separates my music from, you know, I think you can go back on early Harry records and my playing hasn't changed that much, but you stick him in the room and he turns my ideas into a pop song. Um, that's what I've kind of noticed. You've also just kicked off your tour. What can fans expect? One hour. Ah. <laughs> uh, we don't have much, but... Uh, uh, it's going to be a jam-packed hour. It's going to be jam-packed, <laughs> and everyone has been so sweet and kind. And, um, yeah, I mean, we can't, we can't do it without them. So it's been a, a lovely time, and it's going by very quick. So, What inspired this album? Uh... My family, probably. Um, the, the question has come up, why now? And it's the, you know, it's the first time I've been available to do something else, so I kind of went straight into it. But you know, we have a three-year-old boy that uh, has toured the world with us, oh, and he's awesome. always by our side. So I think um, coming out of the pandemic with a, uh, a child has it changed everything. So I think these songs are more or less snapshots of um, that time and onward. So. What's next for you, personally, professionally? Um, we're going to go into festival season uh, when the tour ends. And uh, so we'll maybe, maybe do a bit of that. And I want to make another record by the end of the year. Um, and we have another baby on the way. So. Oh, exciting. Yeah. <laughs> You, you kind of buried the headline there, but that, <laughs> that's really cool. Girl, boy, do you know yet? Boy, yeah. Oh, okay, two boys there. Yep. All right, Mitch Rowland, thank you so much for coming on the show. We want our viewers to know you can catch Mitch on tour. Tickets on sale right now, and you can listen to his debut album, Come June, anywhere you stream music. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, a Boeing whistleblower found dead. We have the details. A deadly home explosion sends shockwaves felt across miles.
so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Chicago. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills star Erica Jane. Celebrity attorney Tom Girardi. This story was a nuclear explosion. Today, several victims will get a chance to finally meet Erica Girardi. And that's sort of a loss for what to say. Did you see the documentary? Yeah. The Housewife and the Hustler? I did. I wanted Erica to say, I'm sorry, face to face. Erica, why did it take you so long? The Housewife and the Hustler 2. Only on Hulu. You should see me. The strongest females fight for the survival of their families. Oh, hey, the queens. You should see me in a crowd. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. One week after Super Tuesday, the race for the White House this November is now all but set, with voters in Georgia, Mississippi, and Washington State going to the polls. ABC News can now project Joe Biden will win the Democratic primaries in the state of Georgia and the state of Mississippi. The contest tonight helping to get him past the amount of delegates necessary to become the presumptive Democratic nominee. A rematch is now all but set with former President Donald Trump this November. And ABC News can now project Donald Trump will win the Republican primary in the state of Georgia and will go on to win the Republican primary in Mississippi. And let's go now to ABC News political director Mr. Rick Klein for more on the rematch this November. Hey, Rick. Yeah, Lindsay, Joe Biden making it official. Democratic voters really didn't have much, many options in this in this primary process, but he ended up clinching about as quickly as he as he could have. This whole process all started back in New Hampshire, where he made a strategic decision not to even appear on the ballot. It looked like that could backfire, but he mounted a write-in campaign and at the time held down his opponents to relatively sm a small uh, uh, share of the vote. That ended up being a fateful decision and kind of kind of stopped the, the, the momentum for any potential challenger. We saw something interesting started to develop when Michigan voted. We saw a big push among people, including some people that were angry over his handling of the Israel-Hamas war, uh, pushed to get an uncommitted delegates to the convention. And more than 100,000 votes in Michigan supported uh, uncommitted. We saw even a higher number, a higher share in, in Minnesota a week later. Again, a little, bit of a, a little bit of a worrying sign for the president. We saw something similar in Colorado, where uncommitted got you know about 9% of the vote. We 
saw it happen in North Carolina, where more than 12 percent got went for no preference in Virginia. Some of his opponents also did relatively well. But this was a clean sweep for all intents and purposes. Joe Biden never really had a scare in this process. And now he's able to focus on the general election out of the State of the Union address last week. And, and as you can see, the polling in the battleground states have it incredibly, incredibly close. And our 538 polling average, uh, you see all these recent polls at 538. They have Trump right now with a very narrow edge. So it is going to be a tough road from here. And a lot of it from here, Lindsay, is going to be about Joe Biden bringing his base fully back on board. All right, Rick, we'll see how he does with that. Thanks so much. President Biden just out with a statement saying he was honored that a broad coalition of Democratic voters voted for him in the face of the, quote, threat posed by former President Trump. And joining us now is ABC News political contributor and former House representative from Virginia, Barbara Comstock, and Christina Sinsoon Ramirez, also an ABC News contributor, as well as president of Next Gen America. Uh, Barbara, let's start with you. Uh, going into the general election, what will the top priorities be for each candidate? Uh, well, I think for Joe Biden, it's going to be to uh, obviously consolidate the Democrats, but he did a pretty good job during the primaries. But now reach out to those disaffected sort of Nikki Haley voters who got 16 percent in Georgia tonight and, you know, who are kind of kind of never, never, ever going back to, you know, use the uh, Taylor Swift song <laughs> and, you know, reach out to those voters, who, independents who are concerned about democracy, who want to see things like uh, support for Ukraine, uh, support for Israel are very concerned about what's not going on in Congress. And I think he made a good start on the um, in the State of the Union. Now, for uh, President, uh, former President Trump, um, he needs to uh, also reach out. But he's his message has been, hey, we don't need you. Uh, you know, if you're a Nikki Haley voter, you're permanently barred. He's continued to make fun of Ron DeSantis, Ron DeSanctimonious, he still calls him. And, um, you know, this weekend he spent with, you know, a dictator, you know, authoritarian type like uh, Viktor Orban, who announced to everyone that he was going to cut off aid to um, Ukraine, uh, that, that, that Donald Trump would if he's elected. And these are obviously troubling things sort of for the Reagan type Republicans. So I, you know, he's got a very different uh, vision than a lot of Republicans are concerned about. So he's got a different coalition than any previous Republican, including himself. And just staying with you for a moment, Barbara, compared to other presidential races in the past, how personal do you expect the attacks to get? Uh, well, you know, this weekend, you know, Donald Trump attacked Joe Biden again with that stutter. I heard from a good friend of mine who is a former chief of staff of a Republican, very Republican guy, who has a son with a stutter, who said, you know, I can never vote for this guy. You know, how do you explain that to your son, someone who gets up there as a former president and is mocking someone with a stutter or a disability? You know, these are the kind of things that just become unacceptable to people, just general decency. So, yeah, that's a problem, you know, along with, you know, the the anti-democratic things, the concerned, you know, how he'll abandon our NATO allies and, you know, all the other, you know, he, he'll wants to be dictator on day one and anti-constitutional. Anti so, yes, it'll be very personal. Um, I don't, for example, think that Joe Biden should engage in debate because of the way he, uh, the way Donald Trump behaves, I think, should just go out and talk directly to the American people. Oh, very interesting. Christine, I want to bring that question to you. Do you think that there should be a Trump-Biden debate? I mean, we'll wait and see. I mean, a lot of it's going to be up to Donald Trump. We know that Donald Trump didn't participate in any of the Republican debates, so we'll see what happens. Um, but ultimately, they've got to go out and make their case to the voters. I think there was a real question before of how much campaigning Joe Biden was going to do, and it's great to see him go out and start making his case, talking about his very, very popular economic policies and vision for the country, which is starkly different than the Trump policies, which are really for the top 1% in big corporations with big tax breaks for them. The vision that Joe Biden laid out is are much more popular policies, pro-labor, 
um, pro-taxing the rich their fair share, and he's got to go out and make that case, and it's good to see him doing that. And, Christina, 19 percent of Democratic primary voters in Minnesota chose uncommitted, uh, demanding that President Biden get behind a permanent ceasefire in Gaza and withdraw military aid for Israel. Washington is the only state voting today that allows that option. Do we expect to see similar numbers there? I think we'll continue to see a significant portion of the electorate using this primary vote as a protest vote. You know, I work with young people across the country. Close to 70 percent of them say they support a ceasefire. There is broad uh, support within the Democratic base for a ceasefire. And we've seen that the Biden and Harris administration has moved um, as far as responding to the electorate, responding to these protest votes. And so I think um, it's very clear that when you look at Trump and Biden on Israel and Palestine, um, there are some stark distinctions, but it's clear also that Biden and Harris can be moved. And so I think we're going to continue to see those protest votes and throughout the election, people calling on the administration to take a greater stance in support of the human suffering of the Palestinian people. And before I let you go, how concerned do you think Biden should be about the uncommitted vote? Um, I think that they are clearly uh, concerned about it. That's why you saw a policy shift post-Michigan, um, a position shift in their messaging as well. I think they should be concerned. Um, there are, when we look at different numbers, a lot of concern about third-party votes, especially for young people that may not understand the full impact in their first election of what it might mean to vote for a third party candidate and how that could impact electing Donald Trump if that isn't their choice. And so um, they should be concerned and make sure that they're really responding to the concerns of this electorate that is clearly demonstrating how upset they are about the current administration's position. Barbara Comstock, Christina Sinsun Ramirez, always appreciate your time and insights. Thanks so much. And with the political campaign season now underway, there were fireworks in Congress today as Biden special counsel Robert Herr vigorously defended his investigation into Biden retaining sensitive material from his vice presidency. Democrats accused him of gratuitous language about Biden's mental acuity and invoked the fact that he's a registered Republican. Republicans slammed his decision not to bring criminal charges. Our chief White House correspondent Mary Bruce has more. Mr. Herr, do you believe Joe Biden's mentally competent? Tonight on Capitol Hill, former special counsel Robert Herr facing hostile questions from both Republicans and Democrats as he defended his conclusion that President Biden had mishandled classified documents but should not be prosecuted. We identified evidence that the president willfully retained classified materials after the end of his vice presidency when he was a private citizen. We did not, however, identify evidence that rose to the level of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Her has come under attack from Democrats for saying one of the reasons Biden should not be prosecuted is because he would likely present himself to a jury, as he did during our interview of him, as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. My assessment in the report about the relevance of the president's memory was necessary and accurate and fair. I did not sanitize my explanation, nor did I disparage the president unfairly. Today, Democrats unloading. You understood when you made that decision, didn't you, Mr. Herr, that you would ignite a political firestorm with that language, didn't you? Congressman, politics played no part whatsoever in my investigative steps. But today, Republicans furious, too, asking, should Biden not be prosecuted just because he's sympathetic? One of the points you make is that President Biden is likely to be an elderly, sympathetic uh, a figure with a poor memory. But how does that bear on any individual's guilt or innocence? Isn't that, again, a question for a judge or jury to decide? Democrats emphasizing Herr's note that Biden fully cooperated with the investigation, unlike Donald Trump. Did you find that President Biden engaged in a conspiracy to obstruct justice? No. Did you find that President Biden engaged in a scheme to conceal? No. But Herr forcefully pushing back when Democrats declared his report exonerated the president. So this lengthy, expensive, and independent investigation resulted in a complete exoneration of President Joe Biden. I need to um, go back and, and make sure that I take take note of the word that you used, uh, exoneration. That Mr. is not a word Herr, that I'm going to continue report, with my questions. Of my task as I'm going to continue with my questions. I know that, that I the term I ultimately reached. I know that whether the term sufficient evidence existed such that the likely you outcome you, you exonerated would be a conviction. I know that I the term willful retention has a Mr. Hurts, my time. 
Some contentious moments there. Thanks to Mary Bruce for that. New troubles for Boeing amid growing concerns about quality control. A longtime worker turned whistleblower found dead from an apparent suicide. ABC's Trevor Alt has those details. Tonight, a Boeing whistleblower now dead from an apparent suicide only days after his lawyer says he'd been deposed. John Barnett worked for Boeing for 32 years and was involved in a lawsuit alleging serious safety concerns with the 787 Dreamliner and retaliation from the company. His lawyers say Barnett was in very good spirits and we didn't see any indication he would take his own life. But police in South Carolina say he died Saturday from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. His body found inside a car in a hotel parking lot. In January, just weeks after a door plug flew off an Alaska Airlines Boeing 737 MAX 9, Barnett spoke with TMZ Live. What we're seeing with the door plug blowout is what I've seen with the rest of the airplane. As far as jobs not being completed properly, inspection of steps re being removed, um, issues being ignored. Since that incident, a six week FAA review of the Boeing production line has raised new concerns. The New York Times reporting Boeing failed 33 of 89 audits, and Boeing supplier Spirit Aerosystems, which builds the 737 MAX fuselage, failed more than half of its 13 audits. As difficult and as painful these inspections are for Boeing, they will help them get back to basics to be able to begin to earn the trust of the FAA and the flying public. So important to regain that trust. Our thanks to Trevor for that. Still much more to get to tonight coming up. It's time for fans of the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC to settle their beef as the two bands join forces, kind of. But next, the Prime Minister of Haiti announces his resignation. We tell you what's next for the Caribbean nation. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag is not a carry in it. How important it made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my own. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Reporting from Miami, I'm Gio Benitez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Exiled Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henry promised overnight to resign once a transition council and temporary replacement could be chosen. Violence perpetrated by gangs eased as a result. The gangs insist, however, that they'll play a role in any future elections, which have not been held since 2016. Muslims in India protested the implementation of a law that fast-tracks naturalization of immigrants from Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan, yet excludes Muslims who are a majority in those three countries. You are finding a law being brought in that actually discriminates by excluding people of one particular faith. 
Since this is the first week of Ramadan, monitors in India are concerned Prime Minister Modi's Hindu nationalist government is attempting to marginalize the country's 200 million Muslims. Torrential rainfall around the Argentinian capital of Buenos Aires had cars floating in the streets. More than five and a half inches of rain fell in less than three hours. And Backstreet is back along with NSYNC. Members from the iconic boy bands AJ McLean and Joey Fatone have joined forces just days away now from kicking off their legendary night tour. Shows have already sold out. Fans are ready to sing along to every word from their hits, most of which are now a quarter of a century old. My, how time flies. Our Stephanie Ramos sat down with them. Tell me why ain't nothing but a heartache. Tell me why ain't nothing but a mistake. Tell me why I never want to hear you say I want it that way. Oh my goodness, that just happened. Come on now. <laughs> These two famous boy banders and myself in sweet harmony. Joey Fatone of NSYNC, known for chart toppers like It's Gonna Be Me. It's gonna be me. And AJ McLean of the Backstreet Boys, behind their own hits like The Call. Let me tell you the story about the call that changed my destiny. Now answering a new call, joining forces for a tour featuring both their band's beloved beats and some new music too. How did this tour come about? He asked me, he's like, would you be interested in maybe doing something just you and I? So the first one we did was in Tampa and sold it out. Then we did it again and it worked again. Now, after 30 years, fans don't have to pick sides. I mean, look, the 90s are back with a vengeance. AJ was first on the scene when the Backstreet Boys burst on the charts with Quit Playing Games With My Heart in 1997. Quit playing games with my heart. And Joey was close behind with NSYNC's I Want You Back later that year. Sink and Backstreet battled it out through the early 2000s on TRL, in mall CD shops, and arenas across America. After NSYNC disbanded in 2002, Joey stayed in the spotlight on Broadway and in the My Big Fat Greek Wedding films, while AJ and the Backstreet Boys kept on touring and even had a Vegas residency. Both of them say fans can now hear all their favorite songs in one legendary night. To get the best of both worlds and be able to see that on stage together is something special. If you come to one show and then you decide to come to another, you probably will see almost two completely different shows. It's a truly one-of-a-kind show every single yeah. night. They've said bye-bye-bye to old beef. Bye, bye, bye. We got through the boy band wars. Was it ever really a war? I mean, that's what everybody no. was saying during that time. Yeah. Oh, it's well, the boy band wars. Yes, was, it was it yes. a yeah, war between... Yeah, if you ever watch Anchorman when they had the brass knuckles and they're <laughs> yeah, ready to fight yeah. the different Anchorman, that, that's, that's exactly that what That was you guys. Oh. Backstreet Boys on yep, one side, yep, NSYNC on yeah, the NSYNC. other. There never was. I mean, I've known Joey since he used to work at Universal. Mm -hmm. There might have been a couple times where if one group turned down something, the other group would do it, or vice versa. I mean, our old managers were kind of like, not to say that they were like pinning us against each other, but it was all like that friendly competition of, oh, well, they did this, maybe you should do that. These two know better than anyone what it's like to be larger than life. He can relate, or I can relate to him. So it's interesting when they, sometimes you're like, oh man, I'm, I'm really frustrated about A, B, C, and D, and I'm like, well, it happened to me once, and you're like, oh yeah, that's right. That's what's a bond that no one's ever gonna understand. You know, I went through some highs and lows, three stints in rehab, you know, struggled with alcohol and drugs for over 25 years. I'm now gonna be three years sober. It's a different world for me now. I never felt good enough. Despite having the fame. Now I understand what that meant. It is a job. AJ is a Backstreet Boy, that is a persona. But Alex is me, that is who I am, and he kinda got shoved down for too long. Stuck in your static. Alexander James now putting out his own electric sound. I've recorded probably 30 songs, and I've been working on this record for the better part of two years. I had a lot to say, and a lot of the songs are very personal, and I cannot wait for the world to hear it. All that matters to these pop fans is the music. But we got to see the guys out of their element, serving up a one-of-a-kind fan experience.
Usually when we're on the road, meet and greet, it's picture, mm -hmm. go, picture, go. And these are people that have been supporting you from day one. So it's great to, to give back even something like making dumplings, uh, which we did poorly. But horribly. How does it feel to have this fan base 30 years later? The fans are still there. They're not going anywhere, and it's such a blessing. We combined have yeah. the best fans in the world. Back in the day, it was always like, okay, are we gonna be number one? It's like, no, we're going on tour to celebrate in that sense. Let's let's have some fun. Help but ask if we'd ever see everybody on one stage. Is there a chance that we could see a boy band collaboration crossover, both bands together? Never say never. I think if it was ever something that would happen, we all collectively would do it for our fans. What is it right now? The second, probably not. Everybody's still doing their own things, but never say never. And we'd like to see Stephanie up there with them as well. Our thanks to the group for that conversation. Still to come, one group in aviation takes a united stand this Women's Month. BC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Everything I've experienced, it made me realize what I want and what I don't want. Tom Brady and Giselle Bundchen announcing their divorce. You didn't think that the marriage would end. You said it was the death of a dream. Yeah. How are you? Well, when you say... Sorry, guys. I didn't know... Can I have a little moment? Giselle Bundchen climbing the mountain. I'm leaving my truth and I'm not apologizing for it. Now streaming on Hulu. The strongest females fight for the survival of their families. Finally tonight, an all-female flight recently took off on a first-of-its-kind trip out of Newark International Airport in New Jersey. According to the FAA, fewer than 10% of all licensed pilots are women. And that's a stat these women are hoping to change one takeoff at a time. Reporter Lindsay Tuckman with our partner station WABC spoke with the crew in our local lowdown. Enjoy the flight. Thank you for your patience and have a great, great day. Pre-boarding announcements aren't normally met with cheers, but today they are, as passengers boarding United Flight 1215 from Newark to Sarasota, Florida, learn they're flying with an all-female crew, pilots, flight attendants, and gate agents. You are in exceptional hands with this crew. The captain, Gabrielle Harding. I love everything about flying. It gives me the flexibility to be a mother, uh, as well as to be able to travel to different places. I, I, I love every aspect of the job. Captain Harding is also the only black woman flying a commercial airline who has graduated from an HBCU pilot program, as well as one of two black women out of more than 2,000 at United that are line check pilots, a prestigious instructor role. Her trainee today, First Officer Julia Iwalefo. This is her first flight as a pilot for United. For the, the girls and the future generation, just knowing that it's possible for us and just to be inspired and knowing that anything you want to do, just put your mind to it. Sleepy passengers perked up at the news, like these women heading on a bachelorette trip. We have an all-female female trip, so this is perfect for the occasion where it's very inspiring. The flight path hasn't always been easy, but Captain Harding says never take no for an answer. There's always going to be a little bit of negative feedback that comes with it, but that's what fuels the soul, right? That's what makes you want to keep on pushing. And also, that was one of the things that made me want to become a line check pilot so that I could help people like Julia get through those barriers so that they don't have to go through some of the pushback that I had to go through. And off they go, flying toward a better tomorrow 
for all women with sky high dreams. Serious girl power there. Our thanks to Lindsay for that. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course on ABCnews.com. The news never stops. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.